You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Life cycle is a series of stages through which an individual, culture, or manufactured product passes through within its lifetime. Welcome to the Life Cycle Radio Show with your host, Pastor Ken Jones. Ken is here to help you through trauma, self care, being overwhelmed, and coping with your life cycle issues. So now, please welcome the host of Life Cycle, Pastor Kenneth Jones. Coming to you live on the BBM Network and TuneIn Radio, this is Life Cycle. I'm your host, Pastor Ken Jones, and as always, I look forward to connecting with you and sharing with you as we talk about the things that will impact your total well-being, spirit, soul, and body. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when a person gets hurt emotionally and, and spiritually, and and also, how does that work also in the realm of the church, you know, one of the organizations that we depend upon you know, to protect us, to to help us, to support us. Uh, we often find people who have been deeply wounded by the family of, of God, and this thing can leave them you know, worn out, exhausted, hurt, desolate. All type of feelings can be uh, can come from this. You know, no one expects the church to be perfect, but we do expect God's family to treat us with more kindness and compassion than the world does. You know, I have more expectations from my family members than I do from the world because, you know, they're my family. So I expect them to love me and to do, do you know, do me right, do things uh, and to honor me and protect me. And I, I expect to be able to go to them and talk to them. And, and if I have a problem, that, that they will all pitch in and help me. But sometimes that not, doesn't always happen. And that can even be even further compounded, you know, by the church. If you were uh, in a church setting and so many people today are experiencing church hurt like never before. Believe it or not, church can hurt. Why? Well, because there are people in it. And even when working together for a common cause, sometimes we still can hurt one another. It's not necessarily intentional all the time, but it can happen and it can be very painful nonetheless. So like I said, church hurt is and family hurt as well is painful or offensive sometimes. And sometimes it can be just cruel mistreatment that occurred between the church members and, you know, members uh, in the leadership. No one is free from experiencing church hurt. Matter of fact, most people say that if you've been in the church long enough, church hurt is inevitable. And many people have many wounds that come from the church, an organization, an institution, just like our family that we depend upon. Yes, I mean, yeah, people have been burned by the church. Sometimes it's not so much the church as well, all the church fault. Sometimes the people that come within the church, they bring things with them that may lead to them, you know, in being divisive or being in contempt, uh, being in, you know, situations where they get their name brought up a lot and things happen. But there are times where we find out that people, who, just like in any position of authority, the church has a, a you know, they have a tier of authority. And sometimes that people in authority can use that authority to, uh, you know, mislead, to misguide, to hurt people, um, especially when someone in leadership is involved. And that can even add more to the situation because that person can get a feeling of betrayal or abandonment uh, because these are people that are supposed to be protecting us, at least helping us at best, and sometimes they don't do that. So how deep is that hurt? Well, that hurt is can be related to physical or sexual abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual manipulation, 
you know, sometimes called spiritual abuse or similar uh, similar issues uh, that touching you or your family members. And that can lead to things like extreme anxiety, even phobia, all types of resentment, bitterness. And that's residual things that can happen because that makes it even more painful if the person is told not to confront the accuser, you know, due to that person's status or position. And maybe, like I said, it's a family member, and, and sometimes family have secrets, and there are things that we want to keep quiet uh, within the uh, within the family. So, what makes it also can make it worse is that person not given a voice to express their hurt and their feelings, and so therefore they must su- suppress that hurt for years, and that can lead to a myriad of emotional problems and spiritual unrest that keep people away from church. Um, I have someone on today that really can help me speak to this because some of her experiences. I have uh, Melissa Davis. She's a, my, my guest today. She was born in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, accepted a call to the ministry. But most most important, she's author of a book called Life of a Church Girl, When the Wolf Lives with Riding Hood. Man, that's kind of a spooky thing. But she has a lot to say about the church hurt and even, you know, family hurt and and so much more that she can share today. And I'm looking for her to share her experiences from a much deeper perspective. Good evening, uh, good evening Dr. Davis. How you doing? I am wonderful, and thank you so much for having me on this evening. I'm so excited to share what um, God has given me the experience to share, the fact that he could trust me with what he's given me. So thank you so much for allowing me to be on this evening to speak to that. Well, as we are... Uh... You know, we if we could talk about this segment like the intros of the segment and the next segment I'd like for you to give your testimony a little bit more, whatever you want to share. I mean, when you think about this issue of church hurt, what are some of the things that come to your to your mind? All right. Um, well, I think the biggest thing being the age that I am now and the difference in when I was younger, church hurt to me, um, I always looked at it like I was angry with God because the church represented God for me. Like that showed me, should have showed me right there that I didn't really have a relationship like I needed to at the time, but the church was a representation of God. So when the church hurt me, when people in the church hurt me, I felt like God had abandoned me. And that's where my anger was. And it, it, I found myself turning away from the very thing that I should have been turning more into as my source. But um, a lot of people, when you say church hurt, they are thinking that that means um, God hurt or, you know, God doesn't love me or God doesn't because of all of these things that people have done. And so now knowing what I know at this stage in life, that's so not the case. People are not a representation a lot of times of who God is and God's love for us. It is people being people. They are people on the street. They are people at your job. They are people at the church. These are the same people. And so when you start looking at people like they are, the people that they are, even when they're not inside the church, then you'll have a better understanding of church. Church just means it was an association with the church, but not in association with God. Wow. That's, I mean, that's a whole lot to say. And, you know, a lot of times when we're ministering to young men, uh, especially with men who don't have a father, and it's kind of hard to tell them about a father God because they had bad experiences or no experience with their father. So I found myself sometime when I'm ministering to people and we're talking about God as a father, and sometimes I even have to not even mention God as a father because it, it triggers an emotion within mm-hmm. some, uh, you know, our young men because so how can you talk about a father God when this guy that supposed to be my father, he's in the house, but he's not present. Oh, he's not around. Mm-hmm. He's not. He doesn't love me. Uh, you know, he mistreats my mom, and and so how can I connect? You know, with this father God, God that you keep talking about when I'm looking at the father that pulled the representation of that, doing that. So I'm looking forward to you sharing some things, especially in our next segment as we talk about this. I want people to know today that the the line is open. If you'd like to call in with questions or make a comment, we'd love to talk to you. 
Our phone number here is 1-866-451-1451. If you tried to call in and didn't ha- didn't get in, just try again. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, broadcasting to you live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. When we come back, we're going to continue this discussion about church hurt. So please stay tuned. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. And we're back. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, and this is Life Cycle, coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And today we're talking about church hurt and how overcoming aspects of abuse. Our phone number here is 1-866-451-1451. If you'd like to call in and participate, we'd love to hear your comments. You may need prayer. If you if you experience church hurt and you want prayer today, then we'll, 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 we'll be willing to take some time to pray with you as we're, still, as we're dealing with this topic today. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. David Amir, you wrote a book uh, concerning this, and you say it's like the, the wolf living with, Riding Hood. I mean, that's a pretty interesting yeah. uh, analogy. Can you please give us this, just take this segment to talk about and give us a testimony, uh, you know, why you wrote this book? Um, well, I really wrote the book as a result of journaling. Um, so after seeing um, therapists and watching therapists on TV, they always said um, the best thing to do sometimes is to journal during your pain. So for years, I would just buy journal after journal after journal, and I would write down as I went along the things that I was um, experiencing or thinking about or um, just going through at that time. And probably after my divorce, I was sitting kind of in a very broken state, and I just happened to start flipping back through the journals of the, over the years of all the things that I had been through and it started bringing memories that I didn't even remember writing about and I picked up my computer and I started to put those journals in some sort of order and then it quickly came to me that it was turning into a book and so it just took years of um, to write the book I'll say because when you write that kind of hurt down, especially when you have to go back and rewrite and reread and do some things, it will bring back all of the old emotions. It will bring back all of the old hurt. It'll bring back the um, insecurities. It, it will bring so many things back on top of what you already are feeling in that moment. So it was a lot. It was an absolute lot. And for me, the, for the subtitle for my book, um, when the wolf lives with riding hood, it speaks to, um, you know, we all know the children's story. She goes off into the woods and she meets this wolf because she's outside of the safety of her own home. But what happens when 
you don't have to leave the safety of your home for the wolf to be right there outside the door. What happens when you close yourself in at night and the wolf is in the house with you? Um, so my book speaks to that and how um, growing up with that, living in my household, the things that it put me through and it subjected me to, um, and being a family member. And we were a very uh, church-centered family. And so everything revolved around the church. And I say that because not everything revolved around God, but everything revolved around the church. So you had to be at every meeting, every situation, every choir rehearsal, every everything was church and God and God and church and church and God. And I'm thinking that if we do all of this and we're spending all this time and then I come home and things are worse at home than when I'm outside of the confines of my home, then what is that really speaking to? And then, you know, when people find out and it's no, 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 you can't tell that you have to be quiet. And then that causes a deeper hurt within you kind of, what do you do with that information? What do you do with that hurt when the person that you're supposed to go to, to say, well, you're supposed to be my safe place. You're also a part of the family. And so now I can't tell you because you're a part of the be quiet crew and, you know, hush and don't tell nobody and, and, or you thinking, or you're dreaming, or you made this up. It just became a growing um, cycle of abuse that got bigger and bigger. It started in one area and it quickly grew to other people. So it started with the abuser and myself. And then when other people found out, then they became a part of the abuse because they don't want you to say anything because you may ruin somebody else's reputation. So now I'm carrying all kinds of secrets. I'm carrying the secret of my what's happening to me. I'm carrying the secret of what's happening in the church. I'm carrying the secret of what nobody wants to talk about. And it started to manifest itself after a while because I started to look for love. And so when I looked for love, um, it had to be this abusive kind of love because that's the love that I knew. And so if this is the love that's going on over here. When I get out here and this young man is treating me in now what I know to be an abusive manner, but didn't know then, it just seemed like love. So my very view of love and of God and of the church and what safety was um, and who I was at a core was shaken and it was taken away from me. And so that's why I wrote the book because it took me until I was almost 40 years old to realize um, and have a true encounter with God. Not that I wasn't saved, not that I didn't know who Jesus was and, and have my confession of faith, not that any of that um, taken away from that. But when I came into real relationship with God, when I was almost 40 years old, um, I quickly learned the difference in God and the church and God and who he really is and not these people over here that saying I'm the representation of God so follow me and do as I say and it was a big eye opener for me and I never want anyone else to walk through life feeling like there's nobody that you can turn to that will listen. There are people out here that will listen and understand and help you walk through it. And the quicker we can walk through it, the quicker healing can begin for that particular person. So that is the the basis of my book. How do you walk through all of this and be okay? I ask a question a lot of times to um, people that I minister to. Um, how do you live and deal with what you know God is calling you to living in the body in the present tense that you're in now. You got to ask yourself that question. How do you use it? How do you build on it? How do you grow from it? How do you nurture it? How do you speak to it? How do you call it out? How do you speak to it in your own self? So those are things that I ask people to look in themselves and get some true, true answers because what people do to you does not define you. It's what you do with what people do to you that defines who you're going to be when it's all said and done. So that's me. That That's what the book is really about. It walks you through the details of it all. It gets my entire story out. But at, at the end of the day, I want people to realize that sometimes the representation of God that you see is not the representation of God. That is That person is not God's mouthpiece when they're doing things to you that should not be done. 
So I hope that I can encourage and I hope that I can speak to and I hope that I can minister to and I hope that I can call out in someone what is lying deep down, covered up between, behind and underneath years of trauma and hurt wow. and anger. Wow. I mean, that is a, a powerful testimony. And we, I, I got a few more questions to ask, and we can do that in the next segment. Uh, the line is open if you'd like to call in with a question or make a comment. Our phone number here is 1 451 1451. I'm Pastor Ken John, broadcasting you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Please stay tuned. Introducing BetterHomeAndGarden.com. That's www.betterhomeandgarden.com with just the letter N in Better Home and Garden. Betterhomeandgarden.com offers you the highest quality products on the market that are environmentally safe and effective and to make them available to you at the lowest possible prices. Betterhomeandgarden.com understands that kind of creativity and do-it-yourself attitude. Thus, we developed our website, betterhomeandgarden.com. Betterhomeandgarden.com offers you the following products right online. Bath, bedding, collectibles, craft, sewing and hobby, food and beverage, furniture, home decor, kitchen and dining, lamps and lighting, large appliances, musical instruments, outdoor cooking, patio items, pet supplies, plant and garden, rug and floor coverings, small appliances, travel and luggage, and so much more. Better Home and Garden is an online retailer offering a wide variety of high-quality brand name merchandise at discount prices. Our service is personal and we aim to please. Visit us at www.betterhomeandgarden.com. Make your home your own. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and to Tune in radio. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, and this is Life Cycle, coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And today we're talking about church hurt and overcoming aspects of abuse. Our phone number here is one eight six six four five one one four five one. If you'd like to call in, participate. I'd love to hear your comments. If you got questions, uh, you want to get more information from uh, you know Dr. Davis, it's as well. That's good too. Uh, and she just shared a testimony, and not, you know, Doctor David, I, I mean, I listened to your testimony here. I mean, how how long? What what's the period of time? Because you said from, from age forty, you was at age forty when you really started begin to deal with this. I mean, how long ago uh, did this did this take place? I mean, I know that was an initial act, but the other aspect of this not having your voice. Um. Well, this the abuse started when I was nine and lasted almost until I was just about 13. Um, and I just recently turned 50 um, several weeks ago. Um, and so if you can imagine being almost 40 years old, and by that time I had been divorced, I had had um, one son out of wedlock, I had, um, I married at age 17, feeling like I um, the words I do and marrying, he, he was a boy himself, he was 19, and marrying someone and going, okay, so marriage says I can get out of this situation, we're going to move out of this house, and I'm going to be safe, and all. And these are the things that I'm thinking in my young 17-year-old mind, and so I went out of the frying pan and into the fire, calling myself escaping one um form of abuse and to now becoming a young mother um, of then by the time we were married right, right after giving birth to my second child. And so I found myself in yet another situation where um, I'm, I'm holding secrets because now I can't tell anybody this is not the marriage that I should have been in and we're not really working and we both children and we don't know what to do. And so now I'm holding the secrets from this new home situation 
and still dealing with the one from the previous home situation. And so it just became years of searching, trying to find Melissa. And all I kept finding was um, more men that recognized that uh, that hurt little girl inside of me that wanted to exploit that for whatever that meant at that particular time, whether it's saying that I love you, but that's only going to last as long as you're giving me what I want. And then you end up by yourself again, um, whether it was standing in a mirror feeling like um, I don't like who I am. I just want to walk out in the middle of traffic and standing in front of a bus. And the only thing wow. that ever stopped me from doing that was that I had two children at home. And all I kept thinking was, if I leave this life, the very people that raised me and allowed these, what I call now shenanigans, allowed these shenanigans to take place are now the people that are going to be responsible for raising my son and my daughter. And I refuse to let anybody raise them that is going to put them in the same situation that I was put in. So that well, was the only reason for living some days. Well, let me ask you a question. Cause you keep saying, you keep making a point about secrets or keeping secrets. So at age mm-hmm. nine, you know, you know, what, what is it? What secret were you keeping and, and why, why didn't your parents, uh, or, or whoever you trusted, and even the church, cause you said, you know, you kind of mix, mix them all together. I mean, why was it necessary to keep secrets? Why was it, was this individual ever confronted? That's the question I have right now. Well, the individual, so, so let me go back. The reason to keep secrets is because you have a 26, 27 year old grown man in the house raping a nine to 12 year old female on a weekly basis. And uh. in the beginning, um, it was threats. You better not tell anybody. Um, I'll hurt your mom, I'll hurt this person, you know, whatever threats you can use against a a child that young were used to keep secrets. So I never exposed what was going on. I never told it to to end all. I didn't tell anyone. Um, Someone else exposed it for me that um, asked me about it because the individual is being accused of doing it to someone else. And when they came to me, I never said anything. I never confirmed or denied. And my silence, they took as an affirmation that it happened to me. And it blew up in the family that way. And I was getting phone calls saying, you better not tell. You're going to ruin so-and-so's reputation. And so I took it upon myself to have a meeting with the heads of the church, which happened to be family. And so in this room with family, uncle, mom, cousin, the abuser, all of us who was also a cousin in this room. And this was years later. And I stood there in my hurt. And for the first time, I verbalized everything that happened to me in detail, down to clothing, down to body descriptions, down to everything. And I was told in that meeting that sometime as a child, you can have an imagination that is so strong that you really believe things happen and they never did. Wow. And then they dismissed me like like I was nothing. And I was told to leave it alone and let it go. And I walked out of that room and nobody came behind me. Matter of fact, I ran out of that room in tears and no one came behind me and said, it's going to be OK. You're going to be OK. Like nobody said anything to me. They never brought it up. And it wasn't a discussed again until I wrote my book. And when it was time for my book to be released, I heard, you better not release this book. Don't you release this book. You don't really want to do a tell-all. You don't really want to do this because you're going to hurt other people. Well, what about the people that hurt me? When does somebody right. step up, even at my age, and speak to the little girl that was hurt inside of me? You know, I, I, think one of the, I, I never got that. Sure. Yeah, I think the problem is a lot of times when we bring things up, especially as a person, a member of the church and, and good status within the church or in the position, you know, it could really works against the victim because later that victim is uh, labeled or uh, ostracized, mm-hmm. you know, then that's the blame game. Mm-hmm. And what did you do? What did you do? And then that's the aspect of accusation uh, that may come out. And so a lot of times people don't realize the impact it can have on a person emotional and spiritual and 
you know, even physical well-being because mm-hmm. ha- having, you know, it seemed like you had to carry all of this on yourself and and uh, to make sure that this person, I, I, I was counseling someone else before, and I, I remember the family said, okay, this is going to be our family secret. We don't want this thing to get out. Um, but there was still no ministry. There was still no right. support. There was still no guidance. There was still no guidance to the, you know, to the person who's impacted. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our next segment. Uh, the line is open. If you'd like to call in with questions or make a comment, and our number is one eight six six four five one one four five one. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, broadcasting to you live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And uh, when we come back, we'll continue this topic. So stay tuned. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, and this is Life Cycle, coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And today we're talking with Dr. Melissa Davis, and who uh, wrote a book concerning church hurt. It's, uh, it's um, I like the title. I, mean, I like the I like the other portion when she said, like living with Red Little Red Riding Hood, living with the wolf. And you shared a lot in your, in your testimony. You shared a lot in what happened. Uh, and you also say that you travel a lot and you speak to uh, other, uh, I guess, other women or other men and women and that maybe experience yeah. some of the same thing. So what are you hearing from them when you um, talk to The these? biggest thing that I hear from um, people is, and sadly it is, that they still are carrying it. Because um, as we know, people come into the church looking for that peace and that solitude and that um and that balance in their lives. But when you have um, people that grow up in the church and a part of their balance is off because their church balance is off, they're still carrying it. So how do people that grow up and you're still in the cycle of abuse or still in the place where the abuse happened, how do you find freedom? And then a lot of people get caught in this place where um, the very people that caused the hurt continue to have power over them. And when they have power over them, then they don't leave. They can't leave this particular place or that particular place because then they're told that it's also going to be a sign of, oh, well, did this really happen? And now you're bringing more shame. And so you continue to be a shame upon our ministry or upon our family or whatever because you are trying to do things that buy you freedom and that get you freedom. So I'm sad to say that I find a lot of people never get free or delivered from that cycle of abuse. It just changes. It goes from physical abuse sometimes to mental abuse. And that's what's happening to a lot of people. They never find freedom. 
You know, I was reading about doctor from Dr. Tim Clinton. He's the president of the American Association of Christian Counseling. He said that the impact of emotional abuse can wreak havoc on one's spiritual life. One of the things we always talk about here that, you know, man is a total being. Whatever affects you emotionally can affect you spiritually. Whatever affects you spiritually also can affect you physically. And so, you know, when we talk about this church abuse, when we talk about because, you know, you, you're putting your trust, you have people in, in a position of authority that you're putting your trust in that are, that are abusing you. Uh, you know, so those things can really help hurt. Uh, and okay. abuse can also, you know, the abuse can also open the door to demonic oppression. And it can, sometimes, and it does. Yeah, and so sometimes leaving a church with unresolved issue can lead also to spiritual drifting. In other words, people mm-hmm. just drift. Like it sounds like you were drifting, you know, the relationship I, or the church. I was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, I did. I drifted a lot. I drifted a lot. Relationships and people and um, even uh, I, I was fortunate enough that at some point I moved away from Maryland um, and was able to. That was my excuse for leaving the church and, and being able to go to another ministry because well, I'm living out of state. So, But people don't get that opportunity a lot of times to tear away from the very thing. So they search within where they are. They try to keep one foot in over here to make people happy, but then they try to put one foot in over here, make themselves happy. And it does. So when you see people, you see that young lady walking down the street and her skirt is super high or her, or her top is cut really, really low. And she's showing everything that she has to um, elicit the response so this is the response, that positive response. She doesn't realize it's drawing a negative response. And you get all of these negative responses until your mind is gone. And when your mind is gone and you can't find freedom in your own mind, you get people with things like split personalities and all of these because you learn how to go outside of yourself so that you can find peace. And when you step outside of yourself, the enemy uses that to step right on into that space. Now, from what I gather, the person that abused you was also church part of church leadership. Am I correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So how? Yes. Yes. So yes. how did how did you feel? You know, and like you said, your your whole life was revolved around the church, and so to see that person and um, you know operating church leadership, and you know on a regular basis, or, or you know a family basis. I mean, how did that? Like you said, you know, we talked about how this may impact our feelings about God, and how were you able to overcome that? Um, it, it it was really hard to overcome. I'm going to tell you that I did not find a real sense of freedom and the ability to be me until um, God gave me a, a a really good husband. He gave me someone that could look at me and see all of my hurt and everything that I've, that's been done to me and things that I've done to myself and say, okay, yeah, you did them, but that's not who you are anymore. Let's move on. And he covered me. So he covered me uh, and God covers him. And that's how I was able to find, um, some sense of peace because for me, my very protection was shaken. If you can't find protection in your own home, when you come home and lock the doors at night, then there's protection and peace nowhere. So God had to put me in a place with someone that I'd known for so many years. I've known my husband now going on 40, going on 40 years. I've known him. Um, We've only been married seven, but he walked with me through all of the hurt. And so God knows what's important to me mostly is protection. If you, I need to be protected. I need a sense of protection. And so that's what I find in my household. But the truth is not everybody finds that, that protection or that, that peace. Um, they just continue to search. And even when the right person comes along that can bring you everything you need, if you are so scarred and damaged, if you can't see it, sometimes. And so it becomes a perpetual cycle of never finding or never coming into whom you're supposed to be. And it's a sad place. Well, you know, sometimes people say that church hurt could be 
on the individual themselves. In other words, the, you know, they, they had the person that comes in always easily offended by everything. And they say that, you know, this church church could be people always challenging authority when the authority doesn't do what you want them to do. And, uh, and they, you know, they may get hurt, they may get offended. And so that's mm-hmm. a lot of, that's a lot of things that uh, people say that that other aspect of church hurt. But uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, for those who are still out there, the line is still open. You'd like to call in with questions or make a comment. Our phone number here is 1-866-451-1451. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, broadcasting to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Please stay tuned. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. And we're back. This is Life Cycle, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And I'm Pastor Ken Jones here with Melissa Davis. And we're talking about church hurt and overcoming aspects of, of abuse. Our phone number here is 1-866-451-1451. If you'd like to call in and participate, or if you need prayer, or make a comment. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity to do so. Uh, when we went off the last segment, uh, we were talking about the issue that some people that come, you know, I'm a pastor, and sometimes as a as a pastor, I got people that come in and they always seem that they're easily offended. You know, somebody may have said something they didn't like, or, or I may not have done something that, you know, they didn't like, and so now they're easily offended. Or, uh, someone sat in their church, you know, someone sat in their chair where they've been sitting in for the last 10 years, and now they hurt, they won't come back for four weeks. Uh, you know, <laughs> Dr. David, yeah, I, mean, I mean, yeah, so I mean, how do you, how do you separate those people you know, from those who are genuine, you know, gen- I don't know. And I don't know if that's genuine. I can't say if they're not genuinely hurt. Maybe they had a hurt experience beforehand. How do you separate, you know, those type of people that are hurt from those people? Uh, well, you you can, if you get an opportunity to sit and counsel with these people and just give them an opportunity to say all the things that are the surface level things. So somebody, so-and-so sat in my seat, or they didn't let me sing my song, or they didn't, you know, and it's all about the my, my, my. Why do they feel like everything has to be personalized? It's, it's my as opposed to not our sanctuary or our chair or our choir. And those people usually have some underlying abuse and things have been taken away from them, whether it's been their body, whether it's been their their voice, whether it's been um, something physical that was that meant so much to them, whether it's the death of a loved one, something has caused a hurt. And so when people get hurt like that, they become very possessive 
over their emotions, over their physical being, over things that they own. And when you talk to them and you let them get out the little things that they think is really the problem and you continue to love them into the conversation changes to what is causing you to be so possessive and what is causing you to be so angry and hurt all the time, then you find out that there's a hurt or that there's an abuse. Sometimes people are itching to tell their story or need to tell their story, but not the right people have listened in the past, not um, the people that should have been or that should have cared about them, have not cared enough about them to listen and understand their hurts. So now they feel like everybody is going to judge them. Everybody is going to abuse them. Everybody is going to hurt them. So the last thing I want to do as an abused person is give one more person, one more saint, one more friend, one more preacher, one more teacher, the opportunity to abuse me any further. So before you do that, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to defend myself, even if it's unnecessary for me to do at the time. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to put up this wall before you can hurt me and a lot of times it's just getting through that wall and that wall is a tough place to get through but it has to come down and if you have the time to sit with those people sit with those people and just listen to them talk for a while and eventually they'll open open up and they'll tell you what's causing that hurt some people just mean it's spiteful i'm gonna throw that out there some people are just mean and spiteful, and that's just the way they are <laughs> and how they're going to be. They they ornery from, from, the, from the womb to the grave. But I would say genuinely about 95% of people out here really have been through some things, and they really want to let it go. You know, they said about 65 million people now are really not, are not really going to church like they used to. And some of the reason why they say that because uh, you know, people are unsure of where they fit in the local church. They may be confused or overwhelmed by church expectation. They may have been rejected mm-hmm. or humiliated or hurt by someone in the church. And most importantly, mm-hmm. they are, the church seemed to be non-responsive uh, to their needs and to their concerns. And, and so I can, I can understand what you're, what you're saying. And, you know, as, as a pastor, uh, it is kind of tough sometimes when I'm dealing with, with uh, individuals and then you, Right. Sometimes when I get to talking to them uh, and peeling back the onion, I do find a lot of aspect of, you know, church hurt or, or you know, the church mm-hmm. is something. It's, a, it's the haven. It's the last haven they can they can come to uh, in terms of relationship. They may have bad relationships yeah. at home, uh, bad relationships in the community. The, the church may be that last haven where they may have some type of voice or some type of position or status or some type of listening ear. I mean, I talked to a lot of pastors and they said they don't like getting to people lying. They said it's just too messy. And many pastors and yeah. many uh, church leaders are just not equipped to deal with that kind of stuff. So they're not I understand equipped, what you're but saying. they're not being trained. They're not being trained to do so. They're not, you know, just because in we we always say many of the call but few are chosen. Well, who is choosing these few now? Because when I grew up, it was supposed to have been God that was that was choosing the few. And now it seems like it's a competition from high school. So you make you make this pastor this one because of we get along and now we we have a good relationship. So I'm gonna put you over this church, or I'm gonna just go out here and be left by myself, and I'm gonna start my own church. And I don't want no covering over me. I don't want you coming here monitoring my church. I'm gonna just be. And then you getting people that are coming in and they see the word church and they have an expectation of what church should be, and it's not. And so you have hurt people hurting people. So instead of letting you hurt me, I'm going to go start my own thing. And whether it's right or wrong or different, I'm going to start it. And so now I'm over here and I'm all out of the will and I'm all in the in, in God's grace because I'm completely out of the will. And now i got people following me and I'm out of the will. Yeah, you know, one of the things, too, because the, the faith movement has done a lot to people. And uh, so to confess you have issues... You know, everybody like to show, you know, it's like Superman. Everybody like to show the cape. They don't want to talk about the kryptonite. And so, um, you know, we got to say those positive statements. We can't appear to be that we hurt or abused or bruised, bruised, you know, and, and because we got to keep that certain image uh, presented before us. And I, I've dealt with a lot of people who come for counseling. You know, you see them in church saying a lot of things, and they can make a lot of lofty statements, but when you get them in this counseling area, 
I mean, they're broken. They're hurt. They've been mm-hmm. abused. Uh, they've been set back. And we got to, you know, let people know that, you know, this is the church is a place where you should be able to find healing and and not pain. Yeah. Um, yes. And and if not, then you find more pain than healing. And it's it's sad. It's sad when you have a person coming for counseling and they're just as broke as the person they're coming to for counseling. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, great discussion. Like the line is still open. If you want to call in with question or comment, our number is one eight six six four five one. One four five one. It's been a great discussion. I'm Pastor Ken Jones with Melissa Davis coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of the Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, Hope, and Support for Caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. I'm Pastor Ken Jones, and this is Life Cycle, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And today we've been talking about church hurt and overcoming aspects of abuse. And, uh, you know, Dr. Davis, uh, can uh, yes. make some final comments? Uh, and we've got, to, we've got to go finish this topic next week. So we'll be back talking about this next week. Sure. So, so the one thing that I, I want to leave everybody with um, just today is if this speaks to your situation, the things that we have talked about today, and it, it and I'm sure because it's, it's a sad time when we have to look at people now and assume that they have been abused and it's less likely that they haven't been abused than that they have. And so if this is speaking to you, I don't care how many people you try to tell. I don't care how many people told you it wasn't true, shut you down. I, it, it doesn't matter to me. Know that there are people out here that believe you. I believe your story. I know it happened, and I know how it left you feeling. I know those spirits that transfer when things like this happen. There are people out here that believe your story. Um, Dr. Ken can get in contact with me. Um, If anyone wants to just get it out and somebody to listen and not judge, we're here. I'll be back again next week um, to talk about and listen to whatever it is that you feel like somebody, just to have somebody say, I believe you, I believe you. And if you know something, especially about a child that is still currently happening, please say something. Don't let your story and what you're feeling and what I felt be some other child's story when it can be stopped in the beginning or in the middle or let this be some some child's tragic story ending with them telling you and you get them that help. So reach out. We want to hear from you. Hey man, thank you. And I look forward to discussing some more this next, next week with you. And, and that's right. If you uh, want to, um, you know, contact us. My uh, 
website number www.practicallivingministry.org and you can send me an email and uh, if you'd like to talk with Dr. Uh, Davis and, and share and let her share your story. And I, and I think that's the most important thing that what she said is to have that ability to tell her story. Even at a young age, she got to, she got to tell the story, of, although it was, uh, you know, the people did not respond to it. And that's a, that's a terrible thing. But when people do tell your story, as spiritual leaders, we need to be there to, to help people and to minister to people. And, and as family members, too, we have to look at those things and, and be, listen to our children and, and, and believe them. Uh, yeah, there are people that lie. There are people that sometimes, uh, you know, so there, were, there were some people that would actually, you know, go t- and lie and not tell all the truth. But there are people that are truly hurting and, and well, just listen to the story and, uh, and the amount of years that took place from the time of the abuse to, uh, you know, Dr. David, you being, you being healed, it to me is, is tragic. And uh, it's so important that the church should be a place of healing. I mean, we are the people of the grace of God. We've been we've been delivered, we've been set free, we've been forgiven, we've been blessed. We're supposed to have the love of God abiding in us, the peace of God abiding in us. And so we ought to be uh, the gatekeepers for any time yeah. anyone is hurt, any time anyone is, you know, is maligned or, or mistreated or abused and, and not make them seem like the you know, they are the victim. They're not the problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're not the, uh, you know, and that's why we should not try to malign their reputation or, or destroy them. And especially when this is a family situation and the family in the ch- within the church is keeping this uh, a secret to protect, you know, uh, a family member and realize that, you know, this family member is maybe doing it to someone else. So I look forward to uh, talking with you next week, Dr. David, about this topic. We're gonna, we'll talk about some strategies that we can to help people to get through these things. So I'm looking forward to, uh, like I said, my name is Pastor Ken Jones, and this is Life Cycle coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Look forward to talking to you next week about those things that impact your well-being, spirit, soul, and body. Have a blessed week. This has been Life Cycle with your host, Pastor Ken Jones. If you're trying to manage your life cycle, be it with relationships, grief, or marriage, tune in to Pastor Ken Jones' Life Cycle. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.